Welcome to the iPad Podcast, a weekly podcast from Max Future. Okay, welcome to episode 103 of the iPad Podcast. This is Lex at Max Future, and today is June 24th, 2012. And uh, this is a chit chat free podcast all about the iPad. And we're going to have a lot of stuff to talk about, a lot of apps, some news, some devices, that sort of thing. And you can support this podcast by going into iTunes and giving it a positive re- review or a positive rating in the iTunes store. Or go to the YouTube channel at maxfuture.com on YouTube uh, and check it out, the, the video version of this. Or just go to maxfuture.com. Anyways, thanks for listening and let's get to it. Okay, so the I guess the big thing I've been thinking about all week has been the big announcement from Microsoft uh uh, beginning of the week on Monday, which was the big announcement of uh, Microsoft's Surface tablets. And they had an event um, on, um, geez, what was that? It was at the beginning of the week, Monday, where they called all these reporters and, um, you know, they basically showed off what's going to be a product maybe coming in the fall to compete with the iPad or other tablets and that's something that Microsoft is calling the surface and you know I talked about this the big news is that Microsoft is making its own hardware for its tablet and I think it shocked its partners like Hewitt Packard and and uh, Dell because you know in the past Microsoft hasn't competed with uh, computer makers that make the hardware but rather Microsoft licenses its software its operating system and that's how Microsoft Windows and Microsoft MS DOS so much dominated the industries because uh, everybody would you know come out with hardware to support the operating system. So I think um, I think Microsoft is sort of freaked out by how well the iPad is doing and how the iPad is sort of cannibalizing PC sales or you know or um, I guess notebook sales. And so Microsoft is maybe worried that its partners aren't going to make really good tablets. And so maybe Microsoft came up with this announcement, even though it's not ready to ship any tablets, just to sort of tell its partners, look, you got to make make a tablet that's at least as good as ours and priced as good as ours if you want to compete. So... You know, I I wonder how well Microsoft is going to do... you know, uh, to recap, Microsoft did not say exactly when the, the Surface tablets are going to ship, but um, but basically said sometime in the fall or the end of the year. And um, it didn't say how much, you know, it's going to charge for these tablets and um, didn't also say what the battery life was going to be like for these tablets. And basically just showed off two different tablets. One is a tablet that is uh, closer in size to the uh, iPad and runs the um, the ARM processor and um, the uh, let's see there's a spec sheet here let's see if we can see the spec sheet here is the spec sheet so there's two tablets the Windows RT the Windows uh, I'm sorry the Microsoft Surface tablet Windows RT and the Microsoft Surface Windows 8 Pro. And, you know, basically the RT uh, is about the weight of an iPad, 676 uh, grams and 9.3 millimeters thick and has a 10.6 inch um, screen. And um, it comes with... um, with um, what uh, either 32 gigabytes or 64 gigabytes and then it's you know Microsoft's making a a larger tablet well a heavier tablet not bigger in size but one that can run an Intel processor so it's more like a laptop in terms of power and can you know that version can run uh, a full version of Windows and legacy window programs and there are differences like for example the the one that's more the weight of the well, and that one by the way is 903 grams so it's 50 percent heavier than the um, 
than the other uh, lighter Windows RT. But um, they differ in other respects too. For example, the the tablet that's more the the weight and the thinness of the iPad has USB 2.0 connection. But if you look at the specs for the um, the the bigger the heavier iPad, uh, I'm sorry, the heavier Surface Windows 8 Pro, it has a USB 3.0 connection, which is the ultra fast connection. And that one comes in sizes of 64 gigabytes or 128 gigabytes. So it's more like a laptop computer. But the other thing is that one also has the ability to, um, to use this um, ink technology, the pen technology and has pen with palm block which uh, Microsoft is selling as a, a means to um, to uh, write with a pen but when it's writing with a pen the, the surface tablet knows that you know it should ignore your palm rest or if your hand touches the, the device and so that it doesn't uh, interfere with the pen pen markings so you know the question is will this really compete with the ipad and will it compete in business now now it's interesting um you know which device do you think is going to do better against the ipad the one that runs the arm processor and weighs as much as the ipad um that one i think is going to be harder to compete with the ipad because um that you can't run the legacy windows programs on it so what's the big advantage of having it if you can't run all these sort of enterprise legacy programs uh, and you know if unless the price is significantly less than an entry-level iPad uh, I don't see how it's going to really compete um, and the thing is you know Apple's still selling the iPad too and I saw recently that a refurbished uh, iPad 2 on Apple's website is selling for as little as I think three hundred and seven dollars or three hundred and eight dollars so if you think about it Microsoft isn't really just competing with the five hundred dollar entry price for an iPad third generation but it's also competing with the second generation iPad because you know I, I have both at home and I'll tell you um, I mean, I really do like the retina screen on the third generation iPad, but I really do like the lightness of the second generation iPad. It, it, it is thinner and lighter than the third generation iPad. So I don't think uh, Microsoft's going to do really well there. Now the question is, will this Intel model, which is probably going to cost a lot more, are there going to be people who buy that? And there may be people who are going to buy a Windows computer who decide, hey, I'll get this Windows 8 Pro tablet, you know, which is, you know, sort of like a like a laptop computer almost. Um, and it all comes down to how smooth and not buggy it is. So I think it's going to be very interesting when it comes out. I bet you... I bet you the Windows 8 Pro device, looking at the specs, there's, um, you know, the entry level model has 64 gigabytes and um, it has a mini display port and uh, USB 3.0 and a micro SDXC, uh, which I guess is a better micro SD card slot than the one that the Windows RT has. I bet you I bet you it's going to go for at least a thousand dollars which is roughly what a MacBook Air entry price is like so I bet you Microsoft tries to sell it for a thousand dollars and I bet you the Windows RT I don't know I, I'm gonna guess 450 bucks they're gonna try to undercut Apple um, on the other hand it's got 60 32 gigabytes and the entry level for Apple is uh, 16 gigabytes so I'm not so sure. Maybe maybe Microsoft will try to get like five hundred or six hundred dollars a pop for them. So, you know, so I saw some of the videos, and one of the odd things about the Surface that I'm wondering might be a mistake from um, from Microsoft is that you know they make a big deal of how there is a kickstand built into the back of the Surface, so you can prop it up by just opening its built in. And then during the demonstration, they talked about how the camera angle 
is is like angled i think they said like at 22 degrees so that when you have your surface angled and propped up that the candle the, the camera is looking at you straight away but if that camera is embedded at a 22 degree angle that means you got to be careful how you hold it you know sometimes i'll do like a video chat with my ipad um, holding it you know and if you're holding it and the camera is not at a perpendicular angle that could be kind of awkward so i mean maybe microsoft envisions people only using the tablet sort of propped up on their desk and not holding it which is not really the case i mean a lot of the times i'm sitting on the couch with my ipad uh, and it's resting on my lap or i'm lying back in bed and so i don't know if it's really you know makes sense to have that sort of angled camera the other thing that's interesting is that there are these two that the high-end one has the USB 3.0 and the, uh, the 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 one that's the iPad competitor does not because I do think that eventually we're going to have in the iPad either Thunderbolt or USB 3.0 now that Apple hasn't incorporated USB 3.0 into the new MacBook Airs and to the MacBook Retina I bet you the next version of the um, of the iPad, the fourth generation, is going to have a 3.0 USB uh, USB 3.0. So maybe with Microsoft Surface having that, that's going to spur on that adoption. I used to think that Apple was going to put um, put uh, Thunderbolt into um, into the um, into the tab into to the iPad, uh, but now I'm thinking Apple's more likely to use USB 3.0 because the dock already that Apple has is a form of USB, and um, you know it it does make sense that um, Apple is gonna um, you know upgrade the speed. So let's see actually what 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 does Apple have here for the specs of the iPad if you just want to if you want to see what they're like uh, let's see they have comparison of the two um, well the third generation iPad uh, what does it have it um, it says here the the weight is 652 grams the third generation that's the Wi-Fi only so 652, so it's lighter. The third generation iPad, which I think is heavier than the second generation iPad, is, is significant. Well, it's 652 grams, and Microsoft's Surface Windows RT is 676 grams. And the depth, Apple's iPad third generation depth is 9.4 millimeters, and the Windows RT is 9.3 millimeters, so it's a milli point, point one of a millimeter thinner. But remember, Apple's still selling the second generation iPad, which is even thinner and uh, lighter than uh, the first, than the third generation. So, look, I think in the long run, this is just going to spur on further development by Apple of the iPad. I think they're going to I think they're going to really try to blow Microsoft out of the water with uh, the next generation iPad. So you got to wonder what is Microsoft's plan because you know, most likely the Surface is going to come out um, in the fall or maybe Christmas time. And shortly after that, Apple's probably going to come out with the fourth generation iPad. And the fourth generation iPad, I think, is going to do a number of things. I think Apple is going to try to make it thinner and lighter. I mean, um, the third generation was heavier than the second generation because Apple really had to make sure that that battery can handle the Retina display. But Apple may have found ways to perfect the efficiency of the processor and the video card in the third generation iPad. And I think Apple's going to really work hard to try to make the fourth generation iPad thinner and and um, lighter. I also think 
that Apple may come out with this, um, you know, mini iPad that's like a seven inch iPad to sort of put further pressure on not only Microsoft, but also the Android market, you know, because that would really, the leader in the Android market are, is the Kindle Fire. And if Apple can come out with a relatively cheap uh, mini iPad, that would really um, hurt competitors. So, you know, other things that Apple may incorporate, because now Microsoft has it in the Surface, is, um, you know, there are these lo lots of third-party um, cases that have keyboards in them. You know, Logitech makes them. Um, uh, and Apple's never made that. Apple has made, you know, just a smart cover. But maybe Apple, and Apple, when, when the first iPad came out, did have that keyboard dock specifically for the iPad. But maybe Apple will will release its own its own um, its own cover that has a keyboard, just um, just because it knows some people will buy it. Um, you know, Apple could price it like sixty, seventy bucks, and probably make a halfway decent um, cover keyboard. I mean, if Microsoft can do it, Apple can do it. And even though Apple, you know, doesn't believe that a uh, you know, um, styluses should be used with the iPad. The fact is a lot of people are using styluses with the iPad. So maybe Apple will come out with its own stylus, you know, to add to the fleet of styluses that are, that are out there. So I think, you know, Apple's going to look closely at the, uh, at the Microsoft Surface and, um, and it will add stuff to the iPad if it feels threatened by Microsoft. Now, one area of weakness maybe for Microsoft in uh, trying to get people to go for the Surface uh, tablet is um, is that it might only come out in the Wi-Fi version. So the LA Times and I guess other people were reporting later in the week uh, that the Microsoft Surface will do, will arrive only as a Wi-Fi device without 3G or 4G connectivity. And maybe Microsoft's doing that because it adds too much to the price. Uh, it says here in the LA Times, um, now a report says the tablet will debut initially as Wi-Fi only. Bloomberg reported that the Surface will launch without the ability to connect to any mobile network, citing two sources familiar with the ma matter. Um, it goes on to say there is some evidence that backs up the claim earlier this week, uh, and this is the LA Times writer. I asked, says I asked Microsoft if it would also be launching 3G versions of the device. And its PR people dodged the question, saying they had nothing to add beyond the Surface's website and a press release. Um, so that could be kind of a, a problem. I mean, I think a lot of people love the um, the 4G speeds that they're getting uh, with um, with the third generation iPad. And from the get go, the iPad had a version that was, you know, a cell phone version, cell data, and um, particularly if Apple wants um, the enterprise to embrace uh, the Surface tablets. You'd think that it would build in uh, cell phone data connection. A lot of businessmen are on the go. And uh, I think one of the reasons a lot of businessmen like the iPad is because it's so mobile. You can just pop it into a briefcase or a bag. And it's like having your computer on the go. And if Microsoft isn't going to... You know, I don't know why Microsoft wouldn't put 3G or 4G into it unless it, there's an engineering issue or a cost issue, and that could be it. But that's going to be a kind of a, um, um, I think that's going to be a detriment to Microsoft trying to sell these devices. Now, over at YouTube, you can watch uh, uh, the video of Microsoft presenting to tech journalists the, the Surface tablets, and I have a link to that. Uh, in the show notes for this podcast. But one of the interesting things uh, about that presentation by Microsoft um, is something that was reported on by Danny Sullivan, who runs the uh, Marketing Land blog. And he's got a really amusing uh, post that came out on June 22nd that I have links to entitled Hands Off Microsoft Service Tablet Review. And basically, he's reporting on the frustration that he had 
at this Microsoft uh, event where, you know, journalists were assembled in Hollywood uh, sort of at the last minute and told to come out to this mystery presentation. And in his article, he really details how the, the, there was something really weird about the event where Microsoft wouldn't really let any of the journalists try actually typing with their, um, you know, these special covers with keyboards in them or even use the Surface tablets. They, they, you know, they basically, it was very orchestrated and Microsoft wouldn't let anybody really use the Surface tablets to, to sort of test out these uh, cover keyboards or to e even test out the Metro interface, which I find to be highly suspicious. And it could be that Microsoft is just still in development and very far off from finalizing a robust you know version of these tablets that works well and maybe they're just petrified that um, journalists were going to see how buggy or problematic um, Microsoft's Windows uh, you know Windows 8 is on 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 tablets so it's pretty funny um, you, know, you got to check out Danny Sullivan's blog. He wrote he wrote this uh, earlier. He, um, frankly, I'm far more excited about Windows 8 tablets coming from the fact that Microsoft has its own with a potentially fancy keyboard. As I wrote earlier, to me, the distinguishing point of the Surface is Windows 8 itself. The fact that unlike the iPad, it looks to be a proper desktop computer tucked into a tablet. Can I really take one of these on the road, use it like a tablet, then plug it back in at home? or elsewhere to ex external monitors or keyboard to use like a desktop. I see something awesome in that. Um, uh, and then he goes on to say, um, well, I think he's just weirded out that they wouldn't let him, um, let him use it. Um, he goes on to say, uh, to me, putting a unit in your lap and pretend typing on it isn't hands-on, especially with this keyboard. That tells you nothing. I pretend typed on it myself at two different stations. That didn't give me a sense of how typing on it really works any more than playing pretend airplane when I was a kid actually let me fly through the sky. Um, he goes on to say, my experience at South by Southwest with a Windows 8 tablet was far more satisfying because it was just sitting there for anyone to use. Microsoft Surface is just a w Windows 8 tablet with a newfangled keyboard. If people can really go hands-on with a Samsung Windows 8 tablet or a Lenovo one or an Acer one, there shouldn't be anything that's secret about Windows 8 itself on a Surface nor anything likely to crash. No particular reason not to let the journalists you've assembled use it. So he seems really pissed off that Microsoft didn't let the journalist actually use the tablet. Um, but again, I think I think there's you know I think there were just too many bugs in it. And Microsoft didn't trust the devices to be sort of handled by all these tech journalists. They really tried to control the event, which I find to be highly suspicious. Now, one of the intriguing things about the uh, upper end Surface tablet that Microsoft is creating, the one that is running the Intel chips, is that it's really sort of uh, like a convertible, convertible computer, right? I mean, think about it. It can run full Windows but also runs the Metro uh, apps. And so it's both like a tablet and essentially like a, like a netbook uh, or, you know, a, um, you know, a nice light laptop like um, the MacBook Air. Now I'm looking for this post. I'm looking on uh, my maxfuture.com website because I remember I wrote an article and I can't seem to find it a long time ago about how Apple, you know, should make a convertible MacBook Air that wouldn't be that hard to do. And if you think about it, you know, Apple's Apple's route is a little different than Microsoft. App, Microsoft is going to have Windows 8 be both a tablet operating system and also a regular computer operating system. And so you're in Metro mode, and then you can go to, like, a full computer mode. But... Um, Apple's taken a different route. Apple basically has one operating system for its mobile devices, iOS, and um, 
and then has you know uh, line now and mount, mountain line coming out which is the operating system for the Mac OS and you know you can run iOS apps on the Mac Intel operating system we know that because um, apps that are developed run in Xcode uh, in the emulator on um, I mean in the um, you know the you know the the, the program that comes in Xcode to run the apps before you run it on a, on a device, it runs on a Macintosh. So I always thought it'd be cool if Apple allowed all your apps that you have from your iPhone or iPad to also run on a computer. And um, I bet you that Apple will do that at some point because then Apple's computers would have a huge competitive advantage over um, the Surface uh, tablets or Windows 8. Um, and how would Apple do it? And I could see, for example, the MacBook Airs would be the perfect place to start. I mean, what if you made a MacBook Air where the screen could be sort of folded back over the keyboard um, or just go to an iOS mode in a MacBook Air just by, I don't know, pressing a button? I mean, how hard would that be to just run it in touch mode and have it be like a touch screen? And, and then when you don't want it to be in touch mode, it goes to regular mountain lion mode. Now, I am um, I'm just playing around here. I've got a MacBook Air, an 11-inch MacBook Air. And, I mean, the thing is, the, the iPad screen is pretty much very close to the real estate size of um, of an 11 inch Air. The dimension is uh, longer for the MacBook Air, but I think I think Apple's going to be heading in that direction. I mean, why? I mean, wouldn't it? How cool would it be if you had, let's say, a $1,200 MacBook Air that could that had a touch screen? and could run all your apps. I mean, I, I think that would be pretty cool. And uh, where you could just have the screen slide in over your keys. That would be cooler than this, hor this sort of snapping snap screen that, um, that um, Microsoft has created for the, um, the Pro version of the Surface tablet. Um, so, I don't know. I think that's in the future of the iPad. I think you're going to see the convertible. I think it's if if micro, Microsoft gets any traction with its uh, Surface Tablet Pro, the one that runs the Intel chips, if uh, if you know if there are a lot of buyers for that, I think uh, I think it's a safe bet that Apple will come out with the convertible MacBook Air that has a touch screen, runs iOS, but can also run mountain line or whatever the successor is to mountain line uh, I think that's very possible now Forbes had an article out by a guy named Nig Nigam Aurora who's a contributor entitled Microsoft Surface sure is no Apple iPad killer and his point seems to be that you know Apple's doing the right thing by not having a convertible tablet that's both a computer and a tablet um, he, he makes the following points. Apple has become an aspirational brand, especially in Asia, and that Microsoft lacks Apple's pizzazz. Uh, and th th these are the reasons why he doesn't think the Surface is going to really do well against the iPad. He says, fun v versus utilitarian. The Surface is a reminder of one pervasive advertisement, uh, of, of, of once pervasive advertisements by Apple that compared PC to a Mac. Mac was portrayed as fun and PC was portrayed as work. iPad is fun. Surface is more utilitarian. Uh, and in the ecosystem, it says Apple has built a very strong ecosystem that Microsoft lacks. And the guy goes on to say, in my judgment, it will take Microsoft one or two years to catch up with Apple's present day ecosystem. And it goes on to say, obviously, by then, Apple will have pulled farther ahead. Microsoft will have difficulty winning the catch up game. So. You know, but I do think that Apple, you know, the, the Macs are clearly starting to look more like the iPad in terms of the interface. So why not 
you know, one of one of the great assets Apple has on the iOS side are just the incredible amounts of great apps that exist in the iOS platform. And you could see that at some point it does make sense to have a touch screen on a small computer like the MacBook Air, particularly if you can uh, angle it and slide it back over the keyboard. Because, you know, if you could have your cake and eat it too when you're on the road, why not have a very powerful, um, powerful computer that can run the apps and also run traditional sort of enterprise or you know um, heavy duty truck 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 driver like uh, apps you know on the uh, on the, on the, some sort of convertible device. Anyways, just a thought. Now the same day that Microsoft launched the uh, Surface or announced the Surface tablets, Apple came out with a new iPad app entitled Do It All. I'm, I'm sorry, a new iPad commercial called Do It All, and um, it was posted on Apple's official YouTube channel and depicts an iPad user performing both entertainment and, and productivity related tasks on a device. And, uh, you know, it, sh it's, it just goes quickly through all the cool things that you could do on an iPad, um, you know, like having fun, but also creating stuff. And, uh, I mean, I think that's going to be Apple's theme, just how incredibly versatile the iPad is and all the great things that you can do. Okay, let's talk about some apps now because a lot of new apps came out and uh, they're very kind of interesting. Now, one, uh, one app that I consider to be kind of controversial is an app that came out in the App Store. Um, geez, it came out June 16th. It's version 1.0. It's called Display Recorder. Now, here's the thing. You may have heard me talking about Display Recorder, but there was a different Display Recorder that I was talking about in the past, and one that I've heavily relied on that was produced by the developer Ryan Petrick, and that was a jailbreak app that you could only get and put on your iPad or iPhone through jailbreaking your iPad or iPhone and getting the Cydia store. And that app was called Display Recorder, and that app did something that I think Apple didn't allow you to do before, which is to screen record in video your movements on the iPad. Now, you could take a screenshot, but you couldn't record video. And um, so for the longest time, if you wanted to do video recording like you do on a computer on an iPad or an iPhone, you had to either jailbreak it or find some hardware means, you know, um, let's say capture the the mirroring outside of your iPad um, you know through the HDMI connection so display recorder has been like a go-to app for me but here's the thing that I find troubling another developer somehow got the App Store to approve a similar app that does screen recording also called display recorder and here it's not Ryan Petrick it's somebody I guess called Begun Software Co. Limited, and the thing is, you know, I was just curious. I thought Apple was going to pull this. Um, it cost a dollar ninety nine, uh, and it works. It has iPad mode and iPhone mode. Now, here's the thing. It, um, it, you know, I ran it on both uh, my third generation iPad and my second generation iPad and my iPhone 4S, and on the third generation iPad, uh, it doesn't do a good job. In fact, the video it records seems affected and not, you know, it doesn't look good at all. And some people have complained that the audio recording it does, it's, it's buggy. And um, so I can't recommend this app, and frankly, I, f I think it's really wrong of them to call it Display Recorder when there's already a well-known app that does that called Display Recorder, even if it's in the Cydia store. Now, the Display Recorder that's the jailbreak version is, is much better because, among other things, the Display Recorder in the Cydia store uh, allows you to use your... Um, uh, put tap tap fingering on so that it can, you can see where your taps are. 
this thing doesn't record any taps and it says it records both video and audio but I haven't been able to get it to record the audio of an app just the audio from like the the microphone so I think that's a little um, that's a little misleading so you know some of the reviews are mixed here too some people say it's uh, it's got bugs and uh, but I'm just curious like w how this got approved because I always thought Apple w wasn't gonna allow any screen recorders in the in the App Store because you know they they thought it would be not a good experience for users that it would be you know there's not enough processing power but if that's the case, then Apple should really allow Ryan Petrick's app display recorder in, in the App Store because um, it's a much better program and it runs much better than this um, program by Begin Software. So, um, you know, maybe I'll do a face-off. I'll show two, two recordings, one by Display Recorder and one by Begin Software and one by... Uh, Ryan Petrick and um, you can see you can see the difference so you know I mean if you're really desperate for a uh, a recording app you could check out this version of display recorder but I can't recommend it you know for many years on PBS there was a show called reading rainbow um, I, that was very popular for teaching young kids how to read and I, I think um, LeVar Burton, the actor, was involved in that, but now there's an app out, and um, it was released by something called RR Kids, Inc., it's a free app called Reading Rainbow, and it apparently has a lot of, a lot of um, the great content that was there, and, and basically the, the app, it says it's for ages 3 to 9, the app offers a trusted library of books customized to your child's interests plus exciting video field field trips to meet fascinating people and places. The size of the app is 105 megabytes. And it says children travel to themed islands such as Animal Kingdom, My Friends, My Family, and Genius Academy discovering quality fiction and nonfiction books. Each book comes alive with audio storytelling to by celebrity actors including spoken word Grammy winner LeVar Burton himself and features light animations and activities to enhance the story and it says the app is free however um, there's a su subscription service available for $9.99 $9.99 a month or six months for $30 and with the um, with the subscription, you get unlimited access to the library and you can choose, so you just get more content. With the free version, I think you get 150 interactive books um, and um, and I guess they frequently update the, the books. There's 16 video field trips and other interactive activities. So, you know, we've seen this trend of a lot of these um, you know sort of animated books and book apps and you know you could you could get the free version and sort of see if your kid really likes it there's just so much content now for kids in the in the store the um, let's see the of 104 ratings it's got four stars and uh, one let me see a bad a bad rating one person gave it one star and said Seems like it could be a really cool app, but no sound on my iPad too. Um, well, another person writes, would give this app five stars. My son loves it, but it keeps crashing in the middle of the books. So, I don't know. Maybe it's buggy because it just came out, but it's free. So maybe hold off on, you know, paying for any subscription. But, um, you know... On the other hand, it's free, so if you don't like it, just delete it. I previously talked about the Cloud On app that works on the iPad, and that gives you sort of access to um, Microsoft Office in the cloud. And uh, according to TechCrunch, it looks like they're, they've raised more money, $16 million in investments, 
and maybe that'll result in them expanding their service in the cloud that works on the iPad. And the app, as the article points out in TechCrunch, lets users view, edit, save, and share their files, as well as access files from cloud storage services like Dropbox, Box, and Google Drive. And um, in Office, editing even includes things like tracking changes in Word, manipulative pivot tables in Excel, and viewing PowerPoint slideshows in full presentation mode. So, among other things, the article sort of mentions that maybe they'll include uh, in this the ability to access iWork, iWork uh, apps in the future, and also to work in groups. So, you know, there's a possibility that you'll see CloudOn uh, expand um, its its abilities on the iPad, and that would make it a a sort of very interesting tool for people. So so check out the uh, Cloudon app if you haven't already. Now one of the things that a lot of people use the iPad for is to make music. Obviously there's this great GarageBand app, but there's also lots of music apps. But one of the things that we're seeing more and more of of the iPad as a hardware, you know, item is that it can fuse with other hardware to make interesting combinations. And uh, A review caught my eye in PCMag.com. Apparently, they reviewed um, they reviewed a dock that's uh, a music dock for the iPad made by Alesis, A L E S I S. It's called the Alesis I/O dock, and um, let's see. I guess it it sells for like at 160 bucks at B and H Photo and 160 bucks at J and R. But basically it's a it's so it's a sort of like a dock where you plug in your uh, iPad and uh, it allows different inputs and and output level controls for uh, various interfaces including mic and line inputs and MIDI in and out and it has excellent audio fidelity according to review they say though it's expensive and it only works with the iPads and and that the the second and third generation iPads don't fit properly, um, but um, they say that the bottom line they say is that when coupled with properly chosen multi-truck apps, it's a solid alternative to space-hungry professional digital audio stations. So it's. Um, it's interesting. I think maybe it, what does it have additional storage in it? Um, so, I mean, the original list price is three hundred ninety nine dollars, but it looks like basically it's a way to like connect a lot of cables and recording stuff into it. So, if you look on the back of the dock, it has a um, you know. Um, regular XLR microphone inputs and and out inputs which are pretty cool so it's if you want to record a lot of um, a lot of mics and you don't want to use sort of like a like a dock connector in, input that this is a way to record in also if you're recording MIDI it acts as sort of a MIDI connector so it's, it's kind of interesting in the article they compare it to a cheaper Griffin product um, called the Griffin Studio Connect for iPad, which is cheaper. It says um, it's going for 150 bucks on, on Amazon, and that's sort of like you just, uh, you, you know, you just sort of, um, I don't know, dock it in, sort of rests at an angle in the dock, and it can re- record audio in MIDI. But unlike the other other one by Alessis, it doesn't have XLR inputs. Um, nor does it have a mic preamp or phantom power. So there's a lot of these devices coming out, I guess, for music, because the iPad's kind of a cool interface. So I don't know how desperate you are for one of these devices, but uh, PC, PC Mag seems to be doing a good job of, uh, of reviewing them. So I have links to 
that Alessis uh, PC Mag review in the show notes. Now, another app caught my eye, and uh, GigaOM did a review of it, and it's entitled iPad Not for Creation. Martha Stewart disagrees. So Martha Stewart's company, according to GigaOM, has put out a an app called Craft Studio, and right now the app is free until July 8th, according to the story, when it will revert to the normal pricing of $4.99. And basically, it says here that Craft Studio closely mimics the act of making a card or any other paper craft uh, without using actual scissors, construction paper. Instead, you do your crafting via the iPad's interface, and you can add glitter, and um, well, I downloaded and took a look at it, and so let's take a look at it. It, uh, it looks kind of interesting. Okay, so let's launch Craft Studio here. Now, um, one of the, well, I didn't get it now, but one of the kind of annoying things about it is that when you, uh, when you first launch it, it seems to, um, you know, make a lot of noise and animation. So let's start a new project here. And um, basically you can add like photos from your library. Um, but the first part of the interface, you get a choice of cards. You can have a horizontal card, which is a print five by seven or a vertical card, which prints five by seven or a square card, which uh, prints five by five. Let's try a horizontal card. So basically you get these sort of craft packages and they give you some for free. They give you everyday, birthday party, uh, dolly lace, nature. And if you want other pack, and each package comes with like stuff. So it's kind of cutesy tootsie, you know, sort of interface where let, let, uh, for every day you've got... Um, you know, you've got the camera, and that gives you access to your photo live album, or you could take a picture, and um, whatever. Let's say you've got stamps, so you can select um, sort of stamps that go with the theme of every day. And there's like lots of little, little crafty stuff like numbers and funny looking fonts and words like good luck, wow. Um, and let's see if you want to get rid of that. And then there's paper. So it's got, you know, you can sort of drag some paper. Uh, let's see what happens. You, you just sort of, oh, it, it corner punches the paper that you have. So if you wanna, if you wanna make it um, rounded on the corners, you just tap it. So pretty much tapping stuff adds stu stuff to your canvas. And then what else? You got pens, so you can uh, select the color. It's kind of sort of a color type interface and a. It's sort of like, so it's almost like a, a writing app and um, you can change different uh, sizes of the pen in terms of thinness and I'm just gonna say hello now the the writing um, I don't know it's not as responsive as some some of the great style you know writing apps that you have it, it seems a little buggy um, so I don't know how great the user interface is now they give you these sort of paper designs. Here's something that's, um, you know, uh, looks like, um, you know, some sort of crisscross pattern. So it's all kind of cutesy. You, if you added something to your project, you tap on it and it gives you a choice to lock it in, send it to the back or send it to the front uh, to crop it. Um, like right now, if I want to send it to the bottom, I just sent this this pattern to the bottom. I can send it back up to the top. And if I want to crop it, let's see, you can make it something other than a square. So it's actually, if if you have a, if you're kind of creative or have a child who's creative, it's sort of, it's sort of like creating like your own little, little design box. Uh, it's not as intuitive in terms of, um, you know, how you move things around, how you resize them. It relies on a lot of um, sort of open windows and selection tools as opposed to just sort of dragging with your finger. So, you know, it's kind of cute. Now, the thing that, you know, it's free for now, but um, the way they make money is they, they try to sell you these other 
packages like ele elegant celebrations, spring, uh, the great outdoors, vacation adventure, summer fun. So look, if I click on it, it's a a dollar ninety nine. So summer fun, they they preview for you, you know, some of the cutesy little things that you you know you can add to to that package. There's like a uh, an ice cream theme and an ice cream truck and and like a summer balloon and uh, popsicles and and little glitter and like a barbecue stuff and so they give you 50 stickers 30 stamps 30 papers five punches three corner punches three punch around the, the page and five glitter colors so this is really for kids in a way if you think about it here's the adventure the vacation adventure um, you know it shows like a 50 style sort of family traveling in a um, you know, in, a, in a, an old station wagon, going to Hawaii. Uh, you know, it's it's sort of nostalgic in a way. You know, all these uh, the graphics that they use. If you're looking at the video version, you can get a a sense of this app. Um, you know, it is cheaper if you have a kid. This app is in some ways cheaper than buying stickers for your kid all the time and and maybe they can um, sort of make their own own little um, you know precious designs um, so they give you several packages so look you know one of the things that's kind of annoying with all these free apps is that there are these built-in you know in-app purchases which try to seduce you into into buying them so um, you know get the free version see if you're a child or if you like it and um, try not to be tempted to always make the in-app in purchase uh, but it's an interesting business model that we now have in the app store where more and more apps are free but then they try to upsell you on additional services and packages in in the app okay so one of the more exciting apps that have hit the uh, app store is something called slide writer and the reason it's exciting is because it's gotten a lot of attention even before it hit the app store because somebody did a proof of concept of a different way to sort of edit text as you're typing on the iPhone or iPad you know uh, one of the things that's kinda difficult is if you want to edit a word on the iPhone or iPad you have to actually go with your finger to the word and select and highlight the area and there, there are no arrow buttons on the keyboard for the iPad so there's no way to go up you know up or down but somebody came up with a proof of concept of where on the keyboard itself you could just sort of swipe left with your finger and that would swipe left or right on the line so that actually hit the App Store it's called Slide Writer and it's on sale now 50 percent off for only 99 cents and it's, it says it's an easy to use text editor that lets you slide your finger above the keyboard to move the cursor. And so it's pretty simple and um, let me take a look at it if you want to look at the the video version of this. Okay so let's launch Slide Writer. Here it is and um, so there's a little, it's very simple the app. Here is the welcome uh, screen it says welcome to slide writer instructions use the space above your keyboard to control your cursor slide left or right to move its position double tap to select text then slide the handles now on the right I kinda like this app It's very elegant there's just two little buttons if you look on the right corner one is to share and the other one is to create different documents so I'm gonna press the plus button and there I have a new document and I can edit it I can I can um, I can uh, write over the name so here we go I'm gonna write test document uh, document and um, there we go here's my test document and I'm gonna click done oh it crashed that's not a good sign um, but that could be I'm running iOS 6 on this iPad so that might not be the app that may be um, that might be the um, 
the operating system. So here we go again, test document. And all right, so here's the beauty of it. You, you start writing this, uh, uh, this is a test. Now watch, I can just see, just go right above the, um, right above the keys and there's like a little line shows up and you can just drag your finger and that's um that's pretty cool so i'm gonna write some more uh, i am writing uh, actually let me use the uh, built-in dictation i am writing this on my third generation ipad uh, there we go. Um, now, let's see. Uh, select all. Now, once you select it, well, it's easy sort of to, to go around. And um, I guess if you write a lot, let's see if we can write some more. Let's write as much as we can, period. I am dictating this through the built-in voice dictation on a third generation iPad. So, okay, so, anyways, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, in some ways, an elegant way to get around typing. Now, if you want to share this message, you can attach it to an email or tweet it or, um, uh, the attach button allows you to copy it to the clipboard and then paste it into another document. The bird there is the tweet button and it'll just tweet it directly. And then the mail button is just for mailing it. So look, it's, uh, it's only 99 cents. If you edit a lot of documents, this might be an easier way to edit. It doesn't have the ability yet uh, to import documents from Dropbox, but I, I bet you the developer will improve on this app. It's getting a lot of scrutiny, and I think a lot of people want Apple to sort of incorporate some of these functions into the iPad, iPad's keyboard, so we'll have to see. Now, another app that got a major update and actually came out as a new app is Bento. Bento was one of the first apps to come out on the iPad. It was it's made by Apple's subsidiary FileMaker, which is a great database um, company, right? FileMaker Pro is a, is a, is an enterprise level database, I guess, on a Macintosh. And I bought a Bento, the original, a long time ago. And Bento allowed you to make all sorts of cool databases. It's almost like a programming app, and the people behind Bento upgraded it, but they released it as a new app because there's no way to sort of pay for a paid upgrade in the App Store. So I have Bento, the original, for the iPad, and then this one they're calling Bento 4 for the iPad, and it costs $4.99. And basically, they redid it, and this is what they say it's new. Um, Bento 4 for the iPad has been reinvented from the ground up and includes numerous innovations that have never been seen on any iPad app before. Powerful drag and drop design tools, form view, table view, split view, and full screen view, 40 new themes, direct access to the Bento template exchange, highlighted searching, multi-field sorting, uh, record, sl record slider, created encrypted field, simple list, GPS location fields, calculation fields, email library data in CSV format. So it's almost like you, you're creating apps within this program. And it says the top 10 uses, uses organized contacts and clients, track projects and deadlines, plan special events and parties, manage lists of to-do uh, items, manage lists of things and collections, track uh, pr products and inventory, track billable hours and expenses, organize music, movies, and photos, store passwords and login details, and sync with ben Bento on the Mac. So I started playing around with it. Let's just take a quick look. Okay, so this is, let's let launch Bento. 
this is what it looks like and it's it's got a simple interface on the left you have your various projects and it comes pre-populated with some projects like to do items inventory notes etc there's a little radio button on the left and if you press that it allows you to create a new library and basically let's see let's create a new library that launches a template of a whole bunch of already set templates such as blank projects contacts to do items calendars expenses home inventory I mean it just has a lot here notes donations now you can get more templates it takes you to the FileMaker Bento uh, template exchange where you can buy or try different um, different Bento um, Bento um, I guess templates uh, I haven't done that yet let's see this is almost like a, a user interface here uh, for iPad it's a little buggy the website so I don't know how quickly you can sort of get templates. Uh, but anyways, let's go back to the interface. Let's create a, um, a time billing program. I'm going to click that. And it's um, creating. There we go. It added a time billing, a time billing um, interface. And then you can... Um, add fields you can add rows so I'm, I'm creating a row this came this has different columns already built into it and let's see I can um, I can customize the field and um, you can you know add add I guess fields to the to the project and if you press the information bar you can choose a theme you can um, email the library you can sync it uh, you've got all sorts of settings set a passcode enable split view uh, auto hide libraries and look it's very powerful and, and the key thing here is that you can uh, customize your databases and create your own databases and so this is just um, you know a quick overlook at Bento but um, I mean it's just sort of showing that the iPad is becoming really a productivity platform um, Bento has been around but you know this this um, this version of it does seem more powerful I'm gonna have to do uh, another look at this at another podcast to give you sort of uh, a more you know a more um, a more detailed look at it so it's pretty cool okay so that's it for episode 103 of the ipad podcast thanks for listening and uh, see you next week this is lex from max future this has been a max future production